Anyway, let's pray as we dive into the sermon, and we'll pray specifically for them. Heavenly Father, I'm praying for my friend Justin and his wife Vanya. May you bless them now as she's in labor. Bring that sweet baby into this world uh, as someone that can shine your light to, to the world. Um, I ask that you'll bless us now as we open your word. Help us to be challenged and moved and pushed in our walk with you so that we know you better at the end of this time. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody loves gifts. We're all, we all love gifts. Some of you are gift givers and you enjoy that, but everybody loves a good gift. Birthdays, Christmas, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, graduation, we love to have gifts. And some people here are big gift givers. Uh, you just love to give gifts. Some of you, you'll, you'll gift an exotic trip around the world, like a Mediterranean cruise. You'll just say, here, this is what it is. Some of you give jewelry. Some of you uh, do whatever you can, no, no matter what your economic, socioeconomic status is. You, you like to give big gifts. Every year at Christmas time, the car company Lexus, Lexus does a great job at making all of us feel poor. <laughs> they, they make the socks that you're giving your husband or the slippers that you're giving your wife feel like it's not good enough. They always have these commercials, you've seen them, the December to Remember commercials, you know, with the big red bows on top of the cars. I, I, this, this, this week I was looking for the right video to, to help you remember what the December to Remember looks like, and I found this one but it, I think it was, might have been last year's version, actually, because it's a family, as they're, they're doing the December to remember, they're gifting a car, but this family must be independently wealthy because they don't just do it one time a year. In fact, let's watch it together. A January to remember. Or an April to remember. August to remember. All starts with a December to remember. Find the gift that keeps on giving at the Lexus December to remember sales event. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. <laughs> if you were counting, yes, that was four cars that that family bought that year. I mean, that's just amazing. I would love to have a car gifted. Jen, I'll get you a car one day, but we're going to save and we're going to buy it later. We're not going to do December to remember. Sorry, babe. Dave Ramsey is the king. We all love big gifts. We all love them. But sometimes the best gifts are the little ones. Like every Father's Day that I can remember, both of my boys have written handwritten cards to me that say, Daddy, I love you. And I would take that over a card any, I mean, over a car any day. Um, I remember uh, not too many years ago, Father's Day, my boys, they went out in the garage and they found my golf bag. They unzipped the pocket and they reached down in there and found some golf balls and they went inside and they found Sharpies, which that's a sketchy thing, parents. Don't leave Sharpies laying around. And they decorated these golf balls for me. They looked like like dark Easter eggs that I would hit around the course and lose in the woods. And those $4 Pro V1s, they were black and it was awesome. And every time I hit one of those, I thought about my kids and how much they love me. Some of the best gifts are the smallest gifts. When I was six years old, um, my sister was having a birthday and I, 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 of course it was the day before her birthday and I thought, I gotta get her something, but I didn't have any money and so I thought, well, I'll make her something. And I thought about what she might like, and I figured it out because my dad had recently uh, built her a dollhouse. And she loved this dollhouse. Uh, he stayed up to the wee hours of the morning on Christmas to make it, have it ready for Christmas morning. And she needed dollhouse furniture. And I thought, I can do that. So I went out in the garage, and I, I found an old door hinge that was just laying there. And I thought, I can use this. And so I, I folded it so it was an L, and I took string, and I tied it so it stayed in an L. And I went out into the, the, the yard, and I found some sticks, and I hot glued the sticks on the bottom, and I spray painted the whole thing black. And when I handed it to her, her face lit up because I'd given her this gift that I'd created. It, it broke within five minutes. The paint peeled off. It was worthless, yet it was the most powerful gift that she had given. This morning... We're looking at a story that I think will challenge us as we think about the little that we have or the most that we have and what it means to be you first kind of disciples. In fact, so often I think that in life 
we have, uh, we have limits to what we can do in the world, and we feel limited by the money that we have, or the, the influence that we have, or the, the uh, in, ingenuity that we have, and we think, oh, well, I can't really make that big of a difference. Yet the story today challenges us and moves us to use even the little to be a you first, me second kind of disciple. In fact, if you've got your Bibles with you, I encourage you to open them to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter, chapter 12, we're starting in verse 41. If this is your first day in a church and you've never seen a Bible before, there's a blue one in front of you, and you can follow along on page 718 in the Pew Bible. 718. While you're turning there, I'll give you some context. Jesus is in full swing of his ministry. Uh, people are following him all over the place. And he finds himself on the steps of the temple. I kind of imagine it as those big stone slabs of the different layered steps, and the steps are in the middle, and he's on kind of one of the sides, and he's sitting there, and the people are gathered around, and he's teaching them. And he, he talks about everything. He talks about marriage. He talks about taxes. He talks about so many different things. In fact, Luke says that he was teaching the good news. That's the gospel. He's preaching the gospel to them. And as he's talking to them, he has a perfect view of the collection plate the offering plates, the, the treasury of the temple. In fact, these, these temples, they would have 13 different spots around the temples where you could give. It kind of reminds me of pandemic world giving, where we don't pass an offering plate around. And instead, we have different ways you can give. You can give online, you can, you can write a check, you can do whatever it is, and you can give the money. And you, or we have a box out in the narthex, you can pass, put your money in there. And in fact, here's a picture of what I think one of the treasuries would look like at the temple. You can put that, there it is. This metal container, beautiful. I wonder if they bolted it down. I don't know. People could put their money in there. And as Jesus is talking, he can see right over to where people are worshiping through their giving as they enter the, the temple or they exit the temple and they put their money in there. And we pick up our story, Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 4, 41. Here's what it says. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And we stopped there for a moment to focus on two points. I think you could find many points in this little passage, these two verses that would, that would make application in your life. But there's two that jump, jumped out at me this week. And the first one is this. There are a lot of people that are giving in this story. Jesus calls out two different groups, rich and poor. But I think you can extrapolate that there are many different people, no matter their socioeconomic status, they're all giving. There's the, there's the kid that, that is a bag boy at Publix. He's there giving. The guy getting minimum wage at Taco Bell, he's there giving. You've got the, the guy that works a couple different jobs. He delivers pizzas, and he drives for Uber, too. He's there. He's giving. You've got somebody else that has a, a bachelor's degree, maybe a master's degree. They've got a full-time job. This is the middle class of America. They've got a, a, they're, they're doing all right, but at the end of the month, they're still tight. They are giving. You've got a guy that is doing really well with finances. In fact, he's got a fully funded 401k. I mean, he's got an extra car. He might even have a boat. I mean, this guy's doing great, and uh, he, he's giving. You've got another group of people that are there that they don't even know how much money they make. In fact, they pay somebody else to manage their finances because they don't even know. They're giving. You've got lots of people that are giving, and as I think about all the different people that have come to the temple that are passing by as Jesus sees them, it brings me to this point, and it's simply this. Here it is on the screen. There's power when everyone gives. Ah, first service was a little more excited. Let me try that again. <laughs> There's power when everyone gives. Amen. You've watched it before. You've seen it in capital campaigns where we, we erect buildings that come out of the ground and there's power when everybody gives. You see it on, on drives for different organizations. You see it in Socktober where everybody gives socks for one cause. When everyone gives, big things happen. There's power when everybody gives. In our church, we have approximately 4,000 members in this church. That's a lot of members. In fact, um, if I calculate correctly, this is the second largest Adventist church in America, second to Loma Linda, who has like 7,500 members. There's a lot of people here. Now, I realize that there's probably people that have 
have, go to a different church, but they never transferred. They've moved away, they haven't transferred. There's probably people on here that aren't even Seventh-day Adventists that are still on the list. There might even be people that, that have died and they're still on the list. So I realize that that 4,000 number isn't completely accurate, but we'll say approximately 4,000 people. Now, if we wanted to, to take this big number and put it down into families, we would divide it by the, the number 2.5. That's kind of the number you use when you're finding families. And I realize that that number gets skewed often because you've got single people, you've got just couples, you've got uh, families that have a couple kids, you've got like the Whitakers who have like five kids and they mess this number all the way up. I know you're watching online. There you go. There's your shout out for the week. But let's say we just divide it by two and a half that gives us 1,600 Forest Lake Church giving units. That's, a, that's quite a few people. Now, I went to Joyce Manzel, who is our finance manager, and I went to Roland, who's our treasurer, and I asked him, I said, hey, can you look through all the records and, and tell me how many giving units our church has, has given, how many giving units in our church have given this year since January 1, 2021? And here's what they found. They found that 603 giving family units have given towards tithe. That's 38%. That's almost 40%. And then 450 family giving units, or 29% of our church family, have given a church budget. And I look at that and I say, it's not terrible. 38% and 29%, I think that's, that's not the worst. But then I think, what would it be like if all gave? Because there's power when everyone gives whether rich or poor, whether you drive a brand, brand new Audi or you have a 22-year-old Honda Accord that leaks oil on the pavement. There's power when everyone gives together. Last month, your church finance committee, uh, it's a great group of people. We meet every month and we talk about how to use God's money the best way that we can. All the money in our church, it's his. It's not ours, it's not yours, it's not mine, it's his. And so your finance committee desperately wants to use his money in a way that honors him as we do the best to manage his money. And so we, we started talking and we started dreaming and we thought, how can we better use the money in the church? Let's set some goals. And so we started, started talking through these goals. One of the goals was, let's grow our reserve fund in our church. Because it would be really nice if we didn't have to worry and stress about church budget and, oh, are we going to make church budget this month? Or are we going to make it this year? What happens if we don't? Wouldn't it just be nice to have a bigger reserve fund where it's just, hey, there's ebbs and flows in church and we still want to fund the ministries as best we can and, and we've got a reserve fund for it. We talked about that. We talked about this. We talked about a depreciation fund. That's too big of a word for me to understand. I leave that to the finance guys. A sinking fund is what they call it. If you don't know what that is, basically, we have an old church building. It's a beautiful church building, but there's oftentimes air conditioners that, got, that die or different parts that are having issues. And so we need a depreciation fund. We got the money right there to replace things. In fact, just this last week, on the roof of the east wing of our church, you can see the progress. Here's the, here's the pictures. Ah, there it is. This is from the second floor of the children's ministry center, looking down on that whole wing. Many of you have Sabbath school classes in there. In fact, the lower left section of windows, that's my office. It, you, you may not know that. Somebody last week didn't know it because they came from getting their kids from Sabbath school, and those windows look, they're almost mirrored. And so they came down, to, uh, a mother and a daughter came down, and they, they got real close to the window, and they were working on stuff and looking close. <laughs> And so I, I just kind of came over close to the window until they could see my face peering through. <laughs> That's my office right there. And that whole wing has had leaks for a long, long time. In fact, if you go in this hallway, like just right over here, there's a whole ceiling tile that's just disintegrated and the, the insulation is falling through because of the leaks. Well, because we know our church needs this stuff, we are paying for this. And your, your finance committee said, let's create a sinking fund so that this kind of stuff, it's already budgeted for, it's already planned for. As we kept talking, your, your finance committee said, here's another goal. We would like to increase the giving units in our church. And I paused there for a minute because not a bit was talked about how to suck money out of wallets in the church. The whole conversation revolved around making disciples of Jesus, that as generosity is a part of life, because we know that money doesn't come from wallets. It comes from people's hearts. And so we focused 
on discipleship. Jesus, he's seeing what's happening here. He sees the power that happens when everybody gives. And as I think about this passage, there's another point that comes to mind. And I'll put it on the screen for you here. Here it is. It doesn't matter how much you can give. It matters that you're giving. As Jesus is watching the people give, there's all sorts of people. He calls out two groups, the rich and the poor. I don't, even, I don't know how the rich gave because um, I don't think that they had credit cards back then. They didn't have checkbooks back then. There wasn't online giving. They couldn't swipe a credit card when they got up to the giving station. I think they had to bring real money. And I don't think they had paper money back then. I think it was real coins that they brought in. And rich people, man, I don't know how they brought it in. Did they bring it in in a sack, like over their shoulder as they came to, to pour it into the treasury? I don't know. Did they have servants bring it along? As I was thinking about these guys, it made me think about those, those plastic funnels that you'll see, like during Christmas time, you'll go to Walmart, and they'll have those, those big funnels that are around, and the kids are always saying, Mom, Dad, give me some change. You got any change? Can you give me a quarter? And, and, and the parents will find, try to find a quarter. Who carries change these days? I barely have cash, let alone change. He gives it to the kid, the kid puts it in, it goes round and round, and then it gets faster and faster and faster, and then it drops in there. Is, is that how they gave back in the day? I don't know. It makes me think about those coin machines at different grocery stores where people will bring their coins, buckets, like a five-gallon bucket of change. They'll bring it and they'll pour it in the machine, and out comes dollar bills. It's so loud and obnoxious. People are over there trying to buy their milk, and there's this loud clanging noise of people dumping change in. As I think about the rich that are giving, it makes me think about this guy. Here's a picture of him. His name is Nick Stafford. There he is. He doesn't look too happy. He just bought a car up in Virginia. He goes to the DMV to register it, and they say, yes, sure, you can register your car, but the tax on that car is $3,000. He leaves in a huff. He heads home. He goes and buys five wheelbarrows. He hires... He hires... 11 workers. He goes to several different banks and gets 300,000 pennies all rolled up. He pays the workers to unroll the pennies to put them in the wheelbarrows that he paid money for so that he can take it to the DMV and stick it to the man as he brings his change in. And while this is a ridiculous stunt that makes no sense, I wonder if this is something like the rich people that came to the temple that day. Did they have handfuls as they clinked and clanked their chains down into the little receptacles? What did it sound like? And then you've got this woman, this widow, and she brings in two coins. Just two coins. That's it. In fact, her coins are worthless. More than likely, the coins were called leptas. Here's a picture of it. You can, if you know Greek, you can read it right across the front there. Lepta. She brought in two of them. Now, a lepta is basically worthless. It is a 128th of a denarius, which is a day's work. So you work a day, you get a denarius. This, this is 128th of it. I don't know how much you make a day. Let's say you make $200. 128th of that is what you get. That's your pay. She brings two of those. It's worthless, but she realizes that being a disciple means that you give. It's a part of life and the part that jumps out at me is that it doesn't matter how much you give. It just matters that you're giving. And I hope that speaks to your heart this morning as it speaks to mine too. It, because a you first, me second life is one that shifts the focus off of you and puts the focus on someone else. And when we are generous and when we give and when we're you first, me second, we have the heart of Jesus in us. And Jesus continues as he finishes up this little passage, two more verses, verse 43 and 44. Here's what he says. As he gets kind of practical, he says this. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. It's kind of cool because it's like we get to eavesdrop as Jesus is there on the steps of the temple and he, he pulls his disciples together in a huddle and he says, Hey guys, hey guys, hey guys. That woman over there, she just gave more than anybody else. And they're thinking, what are you talking about? The girl that just put two in there? 
It's because the woman she gave, not out of her surplus, not out of her bonus, not out of the extra that she had, she gave from what she needed. She gave, maybe it's out of her food budget, or her gas budget, or her uh, electric bill. She, she says, I'm, gonna, I'm giving it to God and I'm trusting him with the rest. And I wonder what percentage she's giving. I wonder what the percentage was like. If she had 10 lepta and she gave two of them, she gave 20%. Maybe she only had four and she gave two of them, that's 50%. Jesus says she gave everything, all she had to live on, that's 100%. That's some intense giving, putting others first and trusting God. And to be honest, I don't know if I trust God that much. And as I think about this woman, as she gives it all, not from the surplus, but what she actually needs, it challenged me. And I hope it challenges you too, to think about the percentage that you give to him. Because I want my heart to be more and more selfless instead of selfish, because I want it to be more generous than greedy, I have to put myself in a position where I can trust him and I can, and can do things that make me move towards generosity. Ever since I was a little boy, I've given tithe. My parents they raised me as I grew up, even when I was a little boy. They'd say, all right, Matt, that's birthday money. None of it's yours. God asked for 10%. Give tithe on it, man. I'd give tithe. When I got married, ever since we've been married, Jennifer and I have always given tithe. It's 10%. If you don't know what tithe goes to, it goes to the conference, and it's beautiful how it works. The conference takes that money and they use it for evangelism all over our conferences. In fact, um, pastors have the opportunity to reach out to the conference with an evangelism plan, and the conference gives God's money that you have, that you gave to the church, to the conference. They give it back to us so that we can use it to reach other people. It's kind of cool. It's reciprocal giving. It's kind of nice. And then also that money goes beyond the Florida conference. It goes to other conferences in the NAD that are not as blessed or as wealthy as the Florida conference. Side note, Florida Conference is the number one tithe giver in the NAD. Georgia Cumberland's number two. Florida Conference may be the number one tithe giver in the entire world, which thinks about that as you give your money to the conference and it goes across the globe. Your tithe money is impacting people across the world. That's cool. We've always given tithe. We've always given church budget too money that stays in the local church. I love this money because I get to see my own money working right here at Forest Lake Church. It's how we pay for bells. It's how we get Sabbath school lessons. It's how we keep the lights on. It's how we can worship together. And it's, it's God's money in your pocket that you give to the church so that you can see ministry happening. And I love that. But a, a long time ago, many years ago, my wife, Jen, who is the treasurer in our family, she said, I think we can do more. And I, and, and I want to grow our hearts. And she said, let's create another fund in our budget. And we'll call it the giving fund. It's specifically only to give to somebody else. That's the only way you can spend it is if you give it to somebody else. That means that we have money that we have to give to somebody else every single month. So that's like, oh, I'm driving down the road and I see somebody that needs money that's a homeless. I can give it to him because I have to give it away. Or, or if I hear a story of someone in our church that needs some help, I have money because I, I can give it away. That, that's what it's there for. I have to give it away. And I'll tell you what, it has blessed our family as it's, as it's pushed us to be more you first, me second minded. In fact, it's just a small percentage, but it makes a big deal in our lives. What percentage of your income do you give away? Is it the bare minimum? Is it from your surplus? Do you give anything at all? Here's the question you have to answer this morning. What needs to change in your personal finances to grow your heart into a you first, me second kind of heart? This last week, I met someone for the first time. In fact, I texted with her and I, I knew about her, but I didn't know her you first, me second heart. And, I, and as I was meeting with her and hearing her story, I thought, man, I know what I have to do. I have to share this story with our church because I believe it's an inspirational story from a young person in our church that has a heart that God's given her, that she focuses more on others than she does herself, that she takes the little that she has and she wants to change the world. So I want to introduce her to you this morning. Caitlin, will you come up now? Don't be nervous. She's already done this once in first service. Come on up. Here's a hand just in case you trip because that would be really awkward. Guys, this is Caitlin Keller. Say hi, Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. 
Caitlin is a junior at Forest Lake Academy, which I think is cool because you're moving on in life. Here's what I think is even cooler. She serves on the Youth Leadership Council of our church, which means I'm a leader and she's a leader, which means we get to lead together. We are leading this church, and I think that's so cool. And on Wednesday, you and your mom, Melissa, came to my office and you shared your you first, me second heart. You didn't know that I was going to do this, but that's okay. Um, So Caitlin, I know that there is a struggle in our community, so will you tell about that struggle, but then also share what God is inspiring you to do? Hi, uh, as Pastor Matt said, my name is Caitlin, and I'm a student of Forest Lake Academy. And last year, um, I decided to start a class called the Innovation Lab, which is pretty much a class that lets you be able to uh, create a program off of things that you're interested in. So I've always been very interested in food, so I decided to focus on that. So in this, I did a lot of research, and I figured out that there's tons of family in our community that struggle with not having enough food, or they don't have enough money to pay for food. So what I decided to do is create, I'm trying to create a garden at my school to help these families, and we're going to distribute it to families who can't pay for food, um, as well as to to local food banks, uh, the Gift and Thrift, and as well as there's a police officer who reached out saying she'll be gladly to uh, distribute it for us. That's awesome. Now, uh, we've talked a little bit about this. Do you know where the garden is going to be? Yeah, it will be at our school. There's uh, right in front of the, the girls' dorm, there's mm-hmm. land where we'll do um, the garden there. there. We have greenhouses that we're going to set up as well. That's awesome. You guys know it too. If you've ever been to Forest Lake Academy, you know where it is. In fact, if you walk right up the hill, just right here, there's faculty housing and different houses there. And right between the faculty houses and the girls' dorm there, there's a little area of land. I think that's where the, the garden's going to be, right? Yeah, it will. Good. Now, has the garden already started? No, we're going to start it on November 15th through the 19th. Uh, we're going to, our school has a week of caring where people will be able to help there. So That's awesome. Um, let me ask you this question. It's a very important question, and, and they are listening. How can the Forest Lake Church help you in this project? So the church can help by uh, telling me names of families that they feel that we can help, as well as helping at the garden if they ever want to come by and um, help us be able to um, help create the garden. So. That's awesome. So digging with shovels or pulling weeds or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Caitlin, thank you so much. That's inspirational. That's a you first, me second heart. Let me pray for you as we close. Heavenly Father, today you've heard the beauty of a young person that uh, has a you first, me second heart. May you continue to challenge each one of us as we uh, endeavor to be greater and deeper disciples as we follow you. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.